So with that, I'm going to just introduce Duke because you already know who he is. So please join me in welcoming Duke Pesto. Well, it's always nice to be before this group again. And uh, my first time as a newly tenured professor, which is good. So oh. I'm thinking to myself, I can really let it rip, but I've sort of been doing that anyway. So <laughs> and it worked out OK. Uh, I do want to thank you for letting me be here th again today, though. And the business about standards, I go a little bit even further than Dave does. The, the simple reality is that education, by definition, is standards. Uh, what you heard from Senator Lehman is typical, right? If you don't support Common Core, you just don't want standards. We've heard this before, haven't we? If you don't sub support Obamacare, you want people to die in the streets. If you don't support the latest radical feminist abortion agenda, it's a war on women. All right, so we just, let's just throw that out all together. Uh, ever since you and I started going to schools and our fathers and our grandfathers and our grandmothers went to school, there have been standards. If they're passing out grades and giving exams, all right, then there's a standard. Sometimes the standards are good, sometimes the standards are poor, but we've always had standards and we always will have standards. Education, by definition, is a standard. The word education is a standard. It implies somebody who knows more than people without education. So we want to set that aside, first of all, because you get lost in the weeds of that. Second thing is, and this is the, the thing that really shocks people, there is no evidence, no mathematical evidence whatsoever that, that national standards have the slightest impact on how your kids perform in the classroom. That's the thing that we have to know. And so we all have, there's a national standard, there are state, local standards, there are every classroom, every teacher, every mom and dad has their own standard for their kids. That has always been and that always will be. But these standards, these national standards, the bigger the standard, the less impact it has on how your kids perform. Zero, zip, nada. So what are we doing it for? So why are we flattering ourselves? Why are we chasing this ghost of standards when they don't mean anything? Well, one of the reasons why we're chasing it, you're going to see today, is because a lot of people make a lot of money by creating an arbitrary standard and forcing your kids to fall short of it so they can continuously produce more curriculum, more textbooks, more exams, different kinds of schools, charter schools, magnet schools, right? uh, voucher schools. All these things, K-12 now, online public schools. The simple fact is, is that standards is an absolute game. And if you take the standards argument away from the Common Core people, they've got nothing left. The, oh, the, their entire argument, which is why this is such an important topic to talk about, the entire argument for Common Core is based exclusively on the argument that these are standards, that they are rigorous, they're going to make our kids know more, they're going to make our kids learn more. It's just not true. And we'll see by the end of the talk today all the evidence for that. But there have been 50 different professional studies done in the last 40 years on edu uh, education standards, both at the state and national level. Again, not any of those standards. Some of them have been from conservative think tanks. Most of them have been from left-leaning or very liberal education organizations. There is no evidence whatsoever that standards like Common Core will impact your kids' classroom performance at all. So that begs an important question. Why in the world are we doing this? And why are we tying our failed schools? In fact, go one step further. Our kids really started to underperform nationally and globally when we first started tinkering with federal standards. You go back to the creation of the Department of Education in the late 1970s. What does, the Department of, what does a big money-sucking entity like the Department of Ed have to do? It has to justify all the money you keep dumping into it. In fact, it needs, to, it needs crisis because it needs more money every year. It's not a coincidence that it was in the late 70s that we started to pay serious attention to standards-based models. We never really had them before this, not on a national level. We had some state models before the late 70s, but we really didn't have national models. That came with the Department of Education. And you can see, right, that the Department of Education, if you want to look at it in its most basic sense, the Department of Education does not get more money if your kids are doing well. The better your kids are doing, the sm smoother your schools are running, the more effective teaching at the state and local level is, the less need there is for the Department of Education. So I'd like to start today by showing you a few things, some things that uh, are new in the talk that most of you I don't think have seen. Certainly we haven't talked about at the machine shed before. One of the most compelling things that is happening recently is that major organizations on the left are beginning to second guess Common Core and are demanding a pullout. 
This matters for us because if you're not on the left, if you're a conservative person, if you're a Republican, they're always going to dismiss your objections. Anybody who disagrees with Common Core is a right winger. Those of you, Dave mentioned the hearings in, in Madison and Eau Claire and Fond du Lac. If you attended any of those hearings, it was absolutely frustrating. The only meaningful objection to Common Core uh, that, that people made was always just right wing nonsense. It's just a small group of radicals. I want to take a few minutes and show you in the last year, since January of this year, in the last five months, six months now, who's pulling out of Common Core. And it's important because the way, the reasons they're pulling out have to do with the standards now that they've seen them. So if we go to January of this year, January 27th of this year, how about the New York State Teachers Unions? Is it possible to take those words, New York State Teachers Union, and arrange them in any different format to get conservative? Can you take, uh, linguistically help me out here. Can you jingle those words around anyway? And yet in January of this year, the New York State Teachers Union, the Board of New York State Teachers Union, Saturday, 27 January 2014, unanimously voted to withdraw support from the Common Core State Standards as they were being implemented. And they also, New York people, declared no confidence in the superintendent of schools who brought Common Core to that state. This is the Tony Evers of New York who single-handedly brought Common Core in without consulting with legislature or the governors, without consulting with schools or teachers or moms and dads. The New York State Teachers Union want Commissioner King fired for this. The New York State United Teachers, a union that represents more than 600,000 education professionals in New York, is also asking the Board of Regents to fire, to remove State Education Commissioner John King Jr. And although the New York Teachers Union previously backed the standards, the union says it will not anymore support the educational benchmarks as implemented or interpreted. And that's a big deal. Not the way they're being put in and not the way they've been interpreted. That's the New York State Teachers Union. And what has happened in New York since this happened? Well, now that the New York State Teachers Union has come out and basically said, we oppose this, our teachers are free to oppose it now. So now the fight is being fought in the classroom level. Wisconsin, we are not going after Tony Evers for his decision to do this single-handedly, and the teachers union in Wisconsin is holding fast to Common Core. These are some areas we have to work on. If we can pry the teachers union loose, and look, I don't, as, as liberal and progressive and self-involved as the Wisconsin teachers union is, it's not more progressive than the one in New York. What, what, what has enabled New York to see something that our Wisconsin union won't see yet? It's the simple fact that they had it two years longer than Wisconsin. Wisconsin has suffered through two years already of, of common core testing. The prototypes for the tests your kids are going to start taking in the spring have been taken twice in New York. Do you know that Pearson, who's orchestrating the tests, will not even let teachers see them? Teachers didn't write the tests. Teachers do not get to grade the tests. And teachers don't even get to see the tests. For two years in New York, as kids plummeted from the 79th and 80th percentile, on the two common core tests all the way down to the middle 30s, those tests are not released to the teachers. So if you're a teacher and your tenure depends on or your promotion depends on, you're a principal whose position depends on your school getting to a certain percentage of your kids getting to the standard, and your teachers didn't write the tests, can't even see the tests? How in the world are you going to correct what's wrong on those tests if your teachers aren't even allowed to see them? This is what the teachers union in New York is balking at, right? All right. How about the NEA? If that was January of 2014, this is February of 2014. This is the largest teachers union in the country. And I would argue, now that the UAW has been spanked down a little bit, this is the most progressive and powerful union in the country, the, the NEA, the National Education Association. They spend more money on lobbying and activism than any other union. And in February of this year, the teachers union, the nation's largest teachers union, is pulling back on its once enthusiastic support for the Common Core Standards, labeling their rollout completely botched. National Education Association President Dennis Van Roekel said, quote, the standards will not succeed without a major course correction, including rewriting the standards and the tests. 
with teacher input. This is staggering. Right, when you think about this. New York, I get it. You could make the argument that New York is just this regional place, but this is the NEA. We ask ourselves, what in the world is the Wisconsin Teachers Union supporting this for? The, what, what the president of the NEA says is exactly right. The standards won't work unless you rewrite them significantly with teacher input and the tests. What he's telling you is exactly right. The ways your kids are being tested and measured have nothing to do with classroom teachers and what goes on in the immediate classrooms. Do you understand why the unions are getting nervous? Not your Wisconsin union, no, they're diehard. But do you understand why new, unions and very, li very liberal unions and unions in very liberal places are getting nervous? Because they have to look out first and foremost for the best interest of their teachers, right? Or what the union sees as the best interest of the teachers. And they're telling you, that Common Core, the way it's done, the way it's orchestrated, the way it's being implemented, the way the tests are being conducted, this is not in the best interest of our teachers. And my personal favorite, January we saw, February, how about May? How about last year, last month, excuse me, when the Chicago Teachers Union, now, now of all the unions in uniondom, the Chicago Teachers Union, this is the most overwhelmingly progressive union in the country. This is the union, the Chicago Teachers Union, that a couple of years ago approved a curriculum citywide that would begin teaching masturbation techniques to five-year-olds. Five-year-olds. This is a radical union. Here is their statement. This is the woman on the corner there. That's Karen Lewis. She is the president of the Chicago Teachers Union. This is a woman that if you met her on the street and you said, hey, Karen, you're to the left of Bill Ayers, she would smile and shake your hand and thank you for the compliment. If you get a chance to look up her history, just type in Karen Lewis. My God, the woman is as left as you can get. And just a month ago, her union unanimously made a few statements about Common Core. And this is big because Chicago has not had its testing yet any more than Wisconsin had. So this is in New York where they've already seen two disastrous years. This is Chicago recognizing what's going to happen here. Here's what Karen Lewis and the Teachers Union said, quote, I agree with educators and parents. Can we just stop there for a second? How often does a teachers union agree with parents? <laughs> I agree with educators and parents from across the country that the Common Core mandate represents an overreach of federal power into personal privacy as well as into state educational autonomy. This sounds like you and me testifying in Madison. This is the most progressive teacher union in the country. This is an overreach of federal power into personal privacy. This is the data mining. This is the advocacy. This is the sociology involved with this. It's also as well as into state educational autonomy. How in the world do the defenders of this, how in the world do they say that local, and local autonomy will not be affected by this? Chicago, she goes on to say, K uh, Karen Lewis, that, quote, Common Core eliminates creativity in the classroom and impedes collaboration. We also know that high stakes standardized testing is designed to rank and sort our children and it contributes significantly to racial discrimination and the achievement gap in America's students, uh, America's schools. She's absolutely right about that. What is the purpose of life? Whenever you get standards, the problem with standards, the second problem with standards. The first one is, is that they have no bearing on how your kids perform. Second big problem is the only way to measure standards, and the bigger the standard, the more comprehensive the test. If you've ever been a teacher, you've all been students. Have we have any teachers here? We've got some teachers here. The idea that some comprehensive test measures what your kids have learned or how your kids function, but with these kind of standards, all you have are these big exams, these big codified exams. What do they actually tell us about your kids' performance? Do you know Pearson Publishing, who's in charge of these exams? ultimately in terms of proctoring them and uh, electronically collating them. You know, Pearson Publishing has helped design these exams, the ones that your kids will be taking next spring, with a 30% mandatory failure rate. They've created the exams so that a minimum of 30% of your kids will fail them. What do you think message this sends, by the way? Why do you think Karen is upset about this? 
You're starting from a, a, a you're not, you, in schools nowadays, our kids' grades are so bad that we often tend to curve them, right? We curve them up so we're not failing more kids. This exam, these exams your kids are going to be taking are designed for a minimum of 30% of the kids taking them to fail them, which of course means that they'll have to keep taking them, right? Oh, and by the way, Pearson won a big contract. Do you know that Pearson Publishing gets paid 30 bucks for every test your kids take? What's 30 times 60 million? <laughs> every single test. Where did this come from? She's right about that. Why, why does she call it uh, racial discrimination? Because the kid, one of the great points of, of unison between the left and the right on Common Core is what this does to already low-performing kids. Kids in inner city schools, kids who have any kind of learning disabilities, kids who for whatever reason are having a hard time keeping up, those are the kids who get hammered hardest by things like Common Core, which is pretty much the entire school system that Karen Lewis oversees in Chicago. This is the problem with it now. But it gets better. The Chicago Teachers Union unanimously crafted a series of resolutions about Common Core. I wish I could show you all 12 pages because it is a complete rehash of things conservatives have been saying for two years now. But I'll just share a few with you. <coughs> the CTU resolution declares that, quote, instructional and curricular decisions should be in the hands of classroom professionals who understand the contexts and interests of their students. Doesn't that make sense? This wasn't done at any level with Common Core. The people who should be in charge of what goes on in the classroom should be educational professionals who understand what kids need and what they don't need in an educational context. And they go on to say that the education of children should be grounded in developmentally appropriate practice. Why have we spent so much time talking about things like the sexuality standards? Why have we spent so much time talking about things about the, the radical insertion at, lo, at the very youngest ages of graphic violence, graphic sex, developmentally inappropriate stuff? Why are so many of the Common Core textbooks interspersed with things that people all across the country on both sides of the aisle call developmentally inappropriate? You've heard Gary Thompson's testimony in, in, in Wisconsin. Uh, I just got off the phone yesterday with Dr. Mary Calamia, who, who testified, a clinical psychologist who testified in New York. Right? I use part of her video in my talk. One of the things that we've got, we've got documents with hundreds and hundreds of psycho psychological professionals, psychiatrists, children's specialists, all calling the implementation of Common Core, the things that Common Core is asking kids to do and to read, developmentally inappropriate. That's what they're telling you there. It's developmentally inappropriate, and Common Core was not done with any meaningful teacher input. They go on to say <coughs> that the Common Core standards were developed by non-practitioners including test and curriculum publishers and educational reform foundations like the Gates Foundation and the Broad Foundation, Achieve Inc. and ALEC. In fact, 90% of what Common Core is comes from educational reform foundations and textbook companies and publishers. 90% of what Common Core is has nothing to do with classroom teachers, has nothing to do with moms and dads educating what's best for our kids in a one-to-one -one individual basis. It comes from people who make money off of inventing new things, new curriculums, new textbooks, new exams, new testing mechanisms. This is the corporate side of Common Core. Now, the fact is, is that this, this very small group of crony capitalist corporations that are profiteering off Common Core, the fact is that they couldn't do that unless the federal government enabled them to. Federal government, the Department of Education, there's no way the federal government would allow a billionaire like Bill Gates to basically buy himself a set of ed educational standards. You use a couple of Washington lobbyist groups, right? The NGA and the CCSSO. Speaking of the NGA, the National Governors Organization, this one of the two lobbyist groups that did this. Did you see how? You, who, who's the sitting president of the NGA? Anybody know? Oklahoma Governor, Governor Oklahoma Governor Mary Fallon. And did you see last week? Oklahoma and Mary Fallon pulled out a Common Core. What does that tell you? Because you keep hearing things like, well, the National Governors Association supports this. Right, people have this misguided notion that all 50 state governors locked themselves in a room and banged out education standards. That'd be better than what we have, but what qualifies your governors? 
to write it. Well, how is Governor Walker qualified to write an education standard? How is Mary Fallon qualified to do it? They're not. But at least you could vote governors in and out. And so Mary Fallon at the NGA pulled Oklahoma out of these for these reasons. Common Core standards were developed by non-practitioners, including test and curriculum publishers and educational reform foundations. It, the, the resolution also says that as a result, the standards better reflect the interests and priorities of corporate education reformers than the interests and priorities of our students and teachers. Now you think about that for a second. When Senator Lehman at the hearings kept asking people, who paid you to be here? Who paid you to be here? Nobody bothered to ask the senator the question. Well, who's paying? Who's going to make all this money off Common Core? All these corporations, these foundations, back in the, all the way through the 1960s, if you measure American educational achievement from 1900 to the late 1960s, America's success rate vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world is like this. American excellence, the acceleration of American education is through the roof. It wasn't until we get into the 70s and the early 80s that we decided American education was a failure. Well, who decided that? Who decided it? Teachers didn't decide it. Students didn't decide it. Moms and dads didn't decide it. State governments didn't decide that American ed the American education that put, put a man on the moon in the late 1960s, right? It wasn't us who decided this. You know who decided it? It was education companies. A group of education reform companies and textbook publishers, they created a test. They made up the test themselves. And they got that test put into the schools. And that test, not surprisingly, proved exactly what the education people wanted it to prove, that our schools were a failure. And ever since that happened in the early 1980s, what have you had? One failure after another, one set of textbook comes, one set of textbook goes. Think about math. We've been teaching math the same way for about 2,500 years. And that has given us what? Newton and Einstein, right, and Galileo. If, it's that, if math is basic, right, the way we've been teaching it, you buy one textbook and you have that textbook for 100 years. I mean, what, you, ch you update the examples every now and then? Instead of covered wagon wheels, it's, it's what? Something, it's, it's, it's iPhones. But other than that, the pedagogy is the same, right? Do you know how many different math pedagogies have we had since the late 1970s? And our kids have gone down, down, down the whole way. Well, who keeps providing all this information? Right. This is what the, the Chicago Teachers Union says. I'd like to show you a very short video clip. This is from Joshua Katz. He and I have very little in common. He is a Florida math teacher and a self-described progressive. But he, and I want you to hear it from him, he gives a very concise overview of when we decided that American schools were failing and why. So take a quick listen to Joshua here. Our toxic culture of education begins with a classic supervillain archetype. I focus on syndrome from The Incredibles. The supervillain's plan is to unleash the doom onto the world that only the supervillain can stop, thus gaining all the desired power. Now this is exactly what happened in education in the 1980s and before, and then culminated in No Child Left Behind. Private education companies realized they could use public education, a multi-billion dollar industry, to create a nearly endless stream of taxpayer money. They channeled millions of dollars into lobbying efforts and focused on two words, rigor and accountability, and put everything into place. State statutes were passed, district rules were enforced, and then finally no child left behind became the national standard. Don't get me wrong about politics. These efforts were underway long before they were passed, so both parties get to take full credit for their disastrous results, especially with race to the top. We somehow took the education system that produced the individuals who put a man on the moon with technology less powerful than the phone in my pocket and characterized that education system as a failure using the word accountability. We only have one way to address accountability, standardized testing. So we implemented standardized testing, and then a 1983 publication called A Nation at Risk showed standardized tests proved schools were failing, teachers were failing, students were failing, and when everything is failing, guess what we need? New textbooks, new workbooks, new resources, new training, accountability systems, new schools, private schools, charter schools, and who is it that creates all of these things that all of a sudden we need? Our supervillain 
private education companies. The only way to feed a business model in this toxic culture of education is to perpetuate a picture of failure. I would love to meet any education company that has a business model that is built upon long-term student success. There simply is no money in long-term student success. Now, how is it that we can believe that a standardized test is what accurately measures student achievement? How can we believe that it measures student growth, that moment when the student's light bulb is finally lit, aha, that moment when a student says thank you for helping him graduate with a 2.0 GPA? How can we attach a number to that moment when a third grader finally has the ability to write his own name? Who, by the way, has been labeled a failure for himself, his teacher, and his school? Yet we crave education standardization. We believe we need these high-stakes tests because we eat up the misinformation provided by these companies and policies using a false validity of their testing results. Our testing culture begins in elementary school. Colleagues of mine work with third graders, third graders who suffer from anxiety from high-stakes testing. From a one-day, one-shot, four-hour computer-based test, the future path of a student is set, an academic identity is established, and a message is delivered loud and clear, either you can or you can't make it. And no matter what the teacher tells the student about how good they are, or what talents they have, if the student doesn't score well on that high stakes test, the third graders know exactly what it means and begin to define themselves. And it's starting to happen now in kindergarten. So we continue this barrage of standardized tests, and the students continue failing, and the districts have to continue the next initiatives that can solve the problems. Who is it that manufactures these products? Who creates these solutions? Our supervillain. Private companies like Pearson and McGraw-Hill, who operate off policy and legislation written by nonprofit organizations and lobbying groups like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council. The Common Core will do even more damage because of its emphasis on high-stakes testing matched with its myopic standards that are disguised in critical thinking. I've seen my daughter's kindergarten and first grade assignments. This isn't critical thinking. This is developmentally inappropriate rote. You think they can fool me with this stuff? Any education reform that doesn't address high stakes testing and the non-cognitive factors of true success like character and integrity is a complete waste of time and it's killing our kids. Now, <coughs> he makes some really great points there and I wanted you to hear them from him. One thing I disagree with, you can't call these companies the supervillains when the only way they get into your schools is through the government letting them in. Uh, it seems to me that there's enough blame to go around here. That you understand how jealous your federal government is. They will not let, not only will they not let people do things that are their prerogative, they're constantly, and we've seen this for 20 years now, the federal government is tr constantly trying to take prerogatives away from you and make the things that you do belong to them. Do you honestly believe that a guy like Bill Gates and a, and a handful of activists and two lobbyist groups could have transformed American education this way without the federal government knowing it? And we know this too from previous talks, right? How did these standards get into your schools? Common Core didn't put them there, they had no ability to. The, the NGA couldn't put them there, the CCSSO couldn't put them there. How'd they get into your schools? The Federal Race to the Top program. <coughs> the federal government creates a program that offers a waiver from No Child Left Behind, because everybody hated it, liberals and conservatives alike. So you get a wait, you take money. Wait, you apply for race to the top money back in 2009 or 10 or 11 by simply applying for that money. Any state that took race to the top money, they got a waiver from No Child Left Behind, they got hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars, and all they had to do was accept the Common Core standards when they were finally rolled out. I'm surprised there were four states that refused to take them all together. We have the distinction of being the first state in the union that took them. <laughs> and so the argument he makes here, but I want to go back to it. We characterize the educational system that put a man on the moon with less technology than the cell phone in your pocket. And we call that a failure. And who was it that called it a failure? As he points out, in the late 80s, you had education reform groups, so-called nonprofit organizations, whose job it was to bring money to educational reform. What were you reforming? This is the point that he makes there, I think, so well. 
And so once we decided through tests that educators really weren't a part of, that schools, your schools weren't tested, your kids were given an exam. And why were they given an exam? Because these lobbyist groups spent so much money on campaigns that when they got the people elected that they wanted, those people approved the tests in the schools. Well, not surprisingly, from the very first test taken, those tests demonstrated that our schools, our teachers, our kids, our entire country was an educational failure. And since that time, it's been one barrage after another of new textbooks, new math, new ways of doing things, new kinds of schools, new kinds of teacher training, all that money spent, all that money garnered, and what has it given us? Where are we now 50 years after we started this craze for standardized testing? Where are we? We're as bad off as we've ever been. And you notice over the last 50 years, the one thing we have never done ever, and because the federal government never does this. When was the last time? The federal government decided, you know what? We're doing things wrong and we're doing them the wrong way. Let's stop and go back the other way. When have they ever done that? All the feds do is they double down, right? Throw more money at it, make the standard bigger. Seed more control to the feds, take more away from the states. 20 years ago, the states had all the control. And it didn't work very well then. Trying to find a state standard was every bit as fraught in some ways as the national, only on a smaller scale. Because that's the other thing, ladies and gentlemen. Simply having a strong state standard has no bearing either on how your kids perform in the classroom. I wish it were otherwise. But I'm an English professor, and I'm smart enough to know that math doesn't lie about this. I'm not saying that we get rid of the idea of standards. I'm simply saying we have to radically reassess how we get to them. Start working on a micro level, not a macro level, right? Let's get our kids to read first. And let's get them to like reading, and let's get them to start reading more complicated things. Let's get our kids performing adequately at math at the lowest grades and working them up higher. But nobody's even thinking in that sense now. It, the, the, bigger, the, the big problem with Common Core is it's one step beyond No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind was our genuinely our first set of national standards. And for 12 years, it has been a raving disaster. So what does Common Core do? It comes along, gives you a waiver for No Child Left Behind, only to give you something much more federal, much more monolithic, much more centralized, and much more expensive, and much more educationally frivolous. That's what you got for it. As, as, as Mr. Katz says, the supervillain, I would argue, that's a shared title. These private companies, I, I asked this rhetorically in all my other talks, and I, I know you'll appreciate this. Do you think the feds would have allowed these standards, Common Core, to be in your schools, if instead of Bill and Melinda Gates, it was the Koch brothers who put up a billion dollars? Do you think, that you think Harry Reid would have been okay with that? If instead of the Koch brothers, in a Gates Foundation, it was the Koch brothers offering up their foundation money? And what if instead of two left-leaning lobbyist groups, she had two right-leaning ones? And what if instead of a very liberal president, she had a very conservative president, who basically took taxpayer money and bribed 46 states to take a set of curriculum standards that they hadn't even seen? Do you think the federal government would have allowed that? But they allowed it this way. And why did they allow it this way? Because of a 1965 federal statute that prohibits the federal government from writing any kind of educational national standards. The feds can't do it. The federal government is prohibited by law from constructing a national curriculum or national standards. So they did the next best thing. They let a small group of people with deep ties to them. Do you know the chief architect of the Common Core Standards, David Coleman? He was a roommate of Arnie Duncan's in college. That's how he got the gig. He was Arnie Duncan, Secretary of Education's roommate in college. The people who put this together have deep ties to the agenda and the attitude and the worldview of the people at the top of the federal government. They were allowed to construct this and craft it and pay for it behind closed doors. And then it was the federal government through race to the top who put it in your schools. That's what you got to look forward to. <coughs> and moving forward here, last, a couple little things as we're winding down. I want to take you back to 2009. Here's the guy who paid for it. 2009. We've had the, the most frustrating thing about the hearings that we had in the state was listening to teachers and listening to principals and superintendents tell you how we're going to have state and local control. We can take Common Core and we can, do diff we can go beyond it if we have to. Well, listen to the guy who paid for it back in 2009. When the tests are aligned to the standards, the curriculum will line up as well. When the tests are aligned to the standards, that happens this spring for us, next spring. 
When the tests are aligned to the standards, your teachers will have no ability to teach anything else. The curriculum has to line up. And that makes sense, right? If the only measure we have of student success is these ridiculous tests, then he who controls the tests controls the teachers. And yet they'll still tell you. If, the, if there was a DPI representative sitting here today, they would stand up and look you in the eye and tell you this isn't true. But there's the man himself. Well, let's go one step further. <coughs> let's get a little bit more technical. I told you we've had 50 different serious surveys in the last 40 years of educational standards. This is the last one. I could go back, but this is the most recent and it's one of the most comprehensive. This is from the Brookings Institute, which is a left-leaning think tank, by the way. This is the Brown Center report from the Brookings Institute that was released about a year ago on educational standards and Common Core. Here are just a couple of summations from the Brown report. Quote, what effect will the Common Core have on national achievement? The analysis presented here suggests very little impact. The quality of the Common Core standards is currently being hotly debated, but the quality of past curriculum standards has been unrelated to achievement. Right. Unrelated to achievement. This is the biggest, most comprehensive, most expensive government in, uh, involvement in standards. Every single previous peer permutation finds that the quality of past standards has been unrelated to student achievement. The rigor of performance standards, how high the bar is set for proficiency, has also been unrelated to achievement. Mr. Katz made the argument that we got rid of an educational system that worked by talking about rigor and accountability. Neither one of those two things has anything to do with how your kids perform. Zip. And so, is it, not, is it surprising that we've created a curriculum, we've created a teaching mentality, we've created an entire pedagogy around rigor and accountability? And so what are we getting? What are we finding? Not enough rigor and not enough accountability. What are we not measuring? How well our kids learn and what they learn and what ways they learn. What's the best way to impact their learning? They go on, the Brown Report. <coughs> Quote, do not expect much from the Common Core. Education leaders often talk about standards as if they are a system of weights and measures. The word benchmarks is used promiscuously as a synonym for standards. And that's what Common Core does, by the way. Common Core never really does talk about the standard and how it'll be met. It instead always uses the word benchmark. And I love the use of the word promiscuous here because there's something terribly whorish about this whole process in terms of who's getting paid to do what. Education leaders often talk about standards as if they are a system of weights and measures, something that you can easily control and calculate. The word benchmarks is used promiscuously as a synonym for standards, but the term is misleading by inferring that there is a real known standard of measurement. How do you measure 60 million kids in thousands of different local communities, some in rural places, some in highly uh, urbanized places, with all the background, and people keep talking about places like Finland or Sweden or Thailand. Well, you know what those places all have in common? Remarkable homogeneity, very low levels of divorce, relatively stable levels of income, right? Very few social distractions, moms and dads both being in the homes. We have nothing like that here, right? Now, how are you going to standardize this? We just don't know. Standards in education, this is the money quote for me, standards in education are best understood as aspirational. Standards are something we can hope for, we can try for, but they have no practical ability to make your kids better. And yet the whole system, and Common Core is just the most ugly manifestation of this, is geared towards standards-based education. Standards in education are best understood as aspirational. And like a strict diet or a prudent plan to save money for the future, they represent good intentions that are not often realized. There is no mathematics you can do to make a standard work. Not with the kind of variables. They're too high. So you guys, show me your common sense here. In a system with as many variables for 60 million kids as we have, what's the best thing you can do to minimize variables? What's the best thing you can do to minimize all these variables? Standardize them. Not standardize them. You, you, the variables are unstandardizable. That's what all the math's telling you. How do you make it easy? 
What do you focus on? Well, what's the best way to eliminate all these variables? Wouldn't that be stop worrying about kids as 60 million and worry about the 20 in your class? How many variables would that lower? How much would that allow you to control and engage things? Especially given that kids go to school, that most schools and school districts reflect the wealth or the poverty of the school district, right? So in a situation where you've got a poor district, where most kids are poor, at least your kids are going to be mostly starting from the same place. And wealthier school districts, it's going to be the same. You very seldom do you have school districts with that level, though that many level, variable levels of background problems. The, they represent good intentions, these standards, that can't be realized. And then, how about this? A final word from the report, and you can find the report online free of charge. I'd ask, if you want to see the math of it, go check it out. It's a pretty comprehensive study. But the final word, a final word on what to expect in the next few years as the development of the tests tied to Common Core unfolds. And that's what's so shameful about this. That Common Core, when you boil it down, is nothing than a series of tests. A series of anonymous, nameless, uneducational input, not being able to be seen by teachers' tests. The thing about these tests is they're the most secretive, privatized, corporate series of tests your kids will ever have taken. Do you know, as we learned in New York, that the New York kids who just got done taking their second year of tests, do you know that there are commercials, advertisements, and product placements on your kids' tests? Those New York's kids who had to take tests, there were also companies like Lego and Mug Root Beer and Nike and the, federal, the, the International Soccer Federation all had placement product ads and drop and trademark logos all throughout the test. Pearson's making money off those too. A final word on what to expect in the next few years as the tests for Common Core come through. Because you understand that Common Core is nothing till they're tested. And what does that tell you? There is no common core until your kids take those first tests. That's why New York, who's had them, wants out now. Because they've seen them. And what was bad about No Child Left Behind is infinitely worse here. It is the tests that give being to the whole program. And if you could just take the tests out of Wisconsin, keep your silly common core. Because if you can get rid of the tests, then common core will fall apart on its own because it's not practicable. But when it was suggested to Secretary Evers uh, that, why don't you do that, Secretary Evers? If you think Common Core is so great, why don't you uh, agree to a three-year hiatus, a three-year moratorium on the national tests? That would give your Wisconsin teachers three years more to master the effective curriculum, right? And Evers' simple response was, if you propose that, I will sue the state. Because Evers knows there is no Common Core without the tests. Well, there's also no money without the tests, right? Because who's, where's all that money funneling into places like Wisconsin coming from? Right. Final word. When the tests, the what to expect, a final word on what to expect as the development of tests tied to Common Core unfolds. As No Child Left Behind illustrates, standards with real consequences are most popular when they are first proposed. In other words, Common Core right now is as popular as it's going to get. What does that tell you? The popu their popularity steadily declines from there, reaching a nadir when the first tests are given and the consequences kick in. Just as the glow of consensus surrounding No Child Left Behind faded after a few years, cracks are already appearing in the wall of support for Common Core. Don't let the ferocity of the oncoming debate fool you. Quote, the empirical evidence suggests that Common Core will have little effect on American students' achievement. The nation will have to look elsewhere for ways to improve its schools. And meantime, while your kids will not be getting measurably better in any of the major subject areas, you know what they're going to get? A lot more indoctrination, a lot more garbage sociology, a lot more premature, developmentally inappropriate sex and violence, a lot more statism, because that's one of the things that Common Core brings to the table in the new standards. This is just the latest of 50 such surveys. The, f the ferocity of the battle is upon us. And I would humbly suggest to you that when your kid, that it, nothing is going to change in Wisconsin, even after the election, unless there's a huge shift. Uh, one of the things that I'm so gratified, we've got some people here today, one of the things that I'm so gratified by is it shows you how much work we've all done, how successful we've been. I have yet to meet a candidate, particularly a Republican candidate, but even most of the Democrat candidates I've bumped into, people who've never been elected before, they're making Common Core an issue. 
Even Democrats trying to run for seats for the first time are now starting to talk about their plans to scale back Common Core. That tells you it's a huge election problem. But even if we get a whole sweeping new bunch of people in the fall, given the, the power of Secretary Evers in the state, right, and what we've seen so far, and I'm going to say this tenderly, what we've seen is a reluctance on the part of our governor to take a really firm stand about this. Things aren't going to change. I'll tell you when they're going to change. They're going to change when Wisconsin kids get their first test, because that's what changed New York. And that's what, changed, that's what began to change California. California teachers unions beginning, had, already having second thoughts based on the test they had to take last year. That's what'll do it. So my last piece of advice to you is, between now and next spring, if we can keep a low fire burning on Common Core and not forget it, and not give it up for the summer, and not say, oh, we'll come back to it in the fall. Keep a low fire burning. We can do that. And the election's the way to do that, with candidates here today telling you what they would try to do to stop this. Keep the fire burning. When those tests hit, then all it's going to take is one gas can to blow that up. So if we can keep educating people, keep motivating them, keep get, making them aware of what the problem is, keep it on the radar screen when those tests hit, there's going to be, why, why would we think it's going to be any different here than New York? or Florida or Kentucky, other states that had the rollout early and have suffered through two years of testing and who also won out Governor Scott in Florida, banned Park from testing in Florida. That's a big deal, right? He just flat out banned them. We're nowhere near that in Wisconsin. Right? So that's where I'll leave you today. That's the part of this we hadn't talked about before. The part about standards and why if we stop and look at them, because that's where we lose some conservatives, right? Because they're just standards. We want standards. Accountability, rigor, those words are music to the ear of a conservative person, aren't they? I'm all for them too. But if I can defend teachers for one moment, being one myself, you can't hold teachers accountable. If you can't get, if we can't get our own kids and grandkids to perform at the same level in every single subject area all the time, and you can't do it. You can't get your seven kids to do it, your 10 grandkids. How in the world can you expect your teachers to do it with 30 million kids or 60 million kids? That's why the teachers' unions are balking. Because if they're going to be held accountable, they should have a say. They should be responsible. Make them responsible for the education and the tests. Make them responsible for what goes on in the classroom. And then if they fail, get rid of them. But we haven't made them responsible for years now. The people behind this, the, I hate to be cliche about it, but you follow the money. Right? And the federal government's promising plenty of money to states who take Common Core. Not just in race to the top. And even if you're a state, like we keep hearing Wisconsin didn't take race to the top money, can we put that nonsense to bed too? Because if you just do a, just go check the books. Do you know how much money has flooded into the state simply by taking the standards? How much money is promised simply by adopting and implementing them? It's not even, the race to the top, the 700 million New York got from race to the top, it's, pit, it's, it's small crackers compared to what's promised them over the next 10 years. Same thing in Wisconsin. So um, I, I ran a little late, so, but thank you very much for listening. It's 1 o'clock. Do um, you have to make a quick comment? I, I'll take any questions you have. I want to take a couple questions. Any, qu any quick questions on that? Yeah. The standards themselves are nothing without how they're implemented, what you do in the classroom. One of the things that may, has made Massachusetts, Massachusetts standards are undoubtedly the best because they're the most realistic. The realistic standards. But what makes Massachusetts standards work is the way they go about implementing them. Who put Massachusetts standards together? It wasn't educational companies. It wasn't corporations. It wasn't groups like Broad and Achieve. It was professors. University professors working in close context with middle and high school and elementary school teachers. The professors said, you know, it's what Dr. Stotsky said when she came here. Dr. Sandy is one of the ones who put together the Massachusetts standards. And I remember when Dr. Stotsky gave her testimony. And at the end of it, the whole committee on that was, you pan away from the shot when Dr. Stotsky gets done, and almost the whole committee's got their head in their hands. It's, it's this classic, oh God, what are we going to do now moment. And somebody asked her, well, what are we supposed to do now? But we spent all this money and time, and she said, you got, do what we did in Massachusetts. You got great universities in Wisconsin. I don't care how, I look, you're talking to the preacher to the choir here. I know how, um, let's just say, entitled and progressive and uh, snotty sometimes our professors can be. 
but they don't want to teach remedial math in English. I don't care what their politics are. No math professor wants to teach ninth grade algebra in college. And Sotsky said, why don't you do what we did in Massachusetts? We got the professors who are going to be, 90% of your kids are going to end up in Wisconsin colleges who go to college. Why not have your professors say, this is the minimum we have to have? in math and science and reading and work down. That's what they did. Massachusetts standards, and Sandy will tell you this, Massachusetts standards were successful not because of the outcome of it, not because of where they aimed, but because of how coordinated education in Massachusetts came between kindergarten teachers and college professors. All up and down the line, they aligned them. Right? And that's what the, the, the Brown Center report says. That standards are all well and good, and you can have them as, notice the positive there. They're an aspiration. Standards are an aspiration, something we should aspire to. But you're never going to get there with these big standardized tests. The big takeaway from the Brown report is these tests tell you nothing. The federalization of education at that level is meaningless. It has nothing to do with the variables of those kids in your classrooms. That's how you go for it, right? Yes. Well, when you say meaningless, just to pick up on that, I mean, my reaction to that is, from a positive standpoint of the child benefiting, yes, um, they're meaningless, but from the standpoint of a government that has specific goals in mind, it has tremendous value to that. Sure. If the purpose of government is to use education as a form of control, hello, right? If that's what's going on, then this is a huge boon to them, right? You reward the people who are on your side, you punish the ones who aren't. And I have said from the beginning of this, um, it's the thing that makes my opponents the most angry, but I think it's true. Or all of us who oppose Common Core, this is the thing that makes them the most angry. This is, Common Core is secondarily about education. It's primarily about all sorts of sociological things. I have said before that, you know, up in, for the last 50 years, if anybody's paying attention, the last 50 years in this country, education, ABCs and 123s, that's what we've done. But in, ABC, in teaching our kids those, we've also been moving them left politically. There's just no doubt about it. The curriculum, the pedagogy, the textbooks, we've been teaching them to read and to write and to add and subtract, all the while moving them leftward. It is my firm contention and I've been in 32 states now, talk to people all over the country, and everybody I talk to seems to get this. That now for the first time, what Common Core really is different in this sense, that the ABCs and the 123s now are subordinated to all that social engineering. That they, that's why the, the pedagogy is so meandering and so counterintuitive. That's why, you know, if they really were concerned about teaching our kids math, Teach them the standard way of doing it. Then do your circles and cubes and all that other stuff for kids who might need to learn a different way. But they've prohibited the teaching of math the way it's been done for thousands of years, only to impose a brand new way of doing it that not only can the kids not seem to grasp it, but we who've, been le who've learned math the other way, we can't even help our kids. It, the purpose of that is the sociology. I think they don't care about the pedagogy anymore. I think they've reached the point where they, if they're making tests and you understand that no way Pearson would be allowed to mandatorily favor, fa uh, fail 30% of your kids if the federal government didn't allow it. I mean, what, what, is, what kind of psychological business are you doing to kids? You're, cre you're giving them tests, the only way to measure their performance on these standards. You're giving them tests that thir minimum 30% have to fail, which means probably, as we saw in New York, the failure rate's going to be closer to 60%. When you're doing that to kids, there is no upside to that. You're not learning anything about those kids. But aren't you also destroying them? That's right. That's what I mean, right? It, you're breaking them down so you can rebuild them as something else. And one of the things we want to rebuild those kids as, utterly incapable of succeeding on their own, without the help of government, without the support of networks. You're tying them now, right? Yes? So Katie's already nervous about her spring tests that are coming. She's been nervous for the last year. She's now in an anxiety group at Catalpa. Three out of the five kids in there have anxiety due to school. You heard what Jonathan said, right? Jonathan. You heard what Joshua said, right? That the third graders, but now it's starting in kindergarten. One of the great innovations of Common Core is that they're going to start doing what they've been doing to third graders now to five-year-olds. And you're already seeing it, right? It's the anxiety. 
You're breaking these kids down. You are, this is the developmentally inappropriate business that Katz talked about, right? Kindergarten kids now with test anxiety. And you know what that proves, by the way? You know what that proves? We need a whole bunch of other, we, we gotta stop even worrying about calculus. Are you kidding? Calculus, advanced math, reading Shakespeare, all that stuff's gotta go. Everything now works on the developmental level. In the name of social justice, right? We've gotta get rid of advanced placement programs, get rid of kids who can do, who can move ahead. No, no, no. We've got, we treat everybody now like they're developmentally disabled. And, and in the sense that they have to re rely on government. Here and then this gentleman. One quick question. With regards to the common core testing, oftentimes any attempt to have autonomy or the curriculum wouldn't be from the state, there's always an effort made to, to show that they're a failure. So yeah. if it's the choice, the charter schools, all one in the same bucket in our parochial schools, is it your understanding that any school then that gets state or federal dollars will be obligated to take the Common Core exam? Or will our <coughs> The parochial schools are a nightmare. The fact that you've got schools who volunteer to take this that are private schools, I mean, that's kind of staggering when you think about it, because whether they like it or not, they're pulling themselves, they're, they're, they're walking into a web with the federal government. You ask a question, I'll just say this, you ask a question about, are parochial and private schools going to be obligated to do this? Well, I would simply refer you to, the, to Senate Bill 219, I believe it was. It didn't go anywhere. Two, six, no, no, 219. This is, this is the one, or 289, what is, does anybody know what is it? This is the one proposed by, it's called the Olson and Kestel Bill. This is the one that Olson and Kestel proposed last year. It didn't go anywhere, but that doesn't mean it won't be revised. They both are, they want, they put together a bill, and the purpose of the bill says this. Any school in Wisconsin that takes any state or federal money at all, even one penny of state or federal money, that school will be required to take the common core exams that all the other public school kids have to take. And if the kids don't perform well enough, boy, what, an, what a standard that is. If the kids don't perform well enough over a certain year period, the state of Wisconsin will be obligated to take those schools over. So let's think about this. If you're a Catholic school, that, that the only thing you take is lunch money. You, you take some national, federal or state lunch money for a program. That means if Olson and Kestel got their bill passed, it, your kids, even if you weren't teaching Common Core in that Catholic school, would have to take the state Catholic the Common Core tests. And inevitably, if your kids aren't being taught Common Core pedagogy, but are taking Common Core tests, they won't do as well. At which point, the state of Wisconsin can walk into that Catholic school and take it over. Two Republicans, well, can you call, uh, two Republicans proposed that bill. Two Republicans, yes, they were. If you can call them that. One last comment, and then we'll, then we'll go to Dave. Yeah. I, uh, I have an observation here, and then a question to sure. go with this. Um, I'm going to go back 24 years here, uh, when Bush uh, Sr. Uh, put the, the first education initiative that I became aware of. It was called America 2000. And there were six standards that we looked for in that program. One was um, accountability with schools and, uh, schools with parental choice. And it, it, it stated that every child must start school ready to learn. Number two was the U.S. must increase high school graduation rates to no less than 90%. Number three, making school diplomas mean something. Four, by the year 2000, U.S. students must be first in the world in math and science achievement. Number five, every, uh, every American adult must be skilled, literate, and, and worker and a citizen. And number six, every school must offer the kind of disciplined environment that makes it possible for our children to learn. Within 24 years, how on earth did we come up with a program like that? And we're all sitting here as responsible adults, concerned about our children. What have we done? What have we done to allow our system to decay to this point? I see the selfish parents who don't pay attention to what their kids are bringing home, and they don't want to bother with it. 
I will, I will agree with you on that, that, that we would not be in this mess today. For It's been 100 years since we as a people decided that it was the primary goal of the federal government to educate our kids. In the 19th century, the 18th century, up until about 1911, the idea that the federal government taught your kids, it would have, been abs would have blown their minds. The founding fathers would, unbelievable. But it's been about 100 years now that we've decided that the feds are responsible for it. And it, we shouldn't be surprised that we're, we're going downhill now. Uh, you think about what happened. In the 70s, a couple of things happened. You get the, the, the war on everything in the 60s from the Johnson administration, right? Then you get the creation of the Department of Education in the 70s. It's not surprising now that we've taken a, the system that was the envy of the world and through way too much federal government centralization, like everything else we centralize, we have, we have taken the system that worked and destroyed it, and now we're beyond destroying it now. Now we are at the point that always happens with this kind of stuff, where you are propagating failure. And we are now, pro we are consciously cultivating and propagating failure. That's what Common Core represents. It is a throwing in the towel. It's common in what sense? Common in the sense that we want to educate kids at the lowest possible denominator so every kid is educated the same way. If you're going to get every kid to the same place, the standard by definition has to be very low, doesn't it? Yeah. Doesn't it generally have to be very low? I mean, we can't, whenever you, why are we getting rid of special education programs? We've lost more gifted and talented programs in the last two years than in the previous 40 combined across this country. Why? Because think about what kids who can get ahead do to the standard. We've got a bunch of kids who are capable of doing accelerated stuff to dick in the same tests, right? The standard gets yanked up, which, which means more kids fall off the plantation. What we have to do, and this is where the social justice aspect of the curriculum comes in. It's not fair that, so, what, what, how many, what percent of kids can do math at a high level? I mean, it's a serious question. We can, we can make many math literate kids. Yeah, but, but how, what, what percentage of kids can really do math? But so what? What percentage of kids can, would want to even do what I do as an English professor? So what? The world needs more than CPAs. But rather than allow the kids and, and create a climate where we try to raise other kids, and have the kids who can really go, go, in the name of equality. And that's what the Common Core stuff has done. It's recognized that kids are individually different. And the only way to minimize those differences is to tamp down expectations. And the, why do groups like the Chambers of Commerce support Common Core? The same Chambers of Commerce at the national level, by the way. And one of the reasons I'm convinced, uh, one of the reasons why Governor Walker is quiet about Common Core, relatively speaking, is because his chamber is in his ear telling him how great this is going to be for kids. Well, why would the governor understand what Common Core does? I, I think he's hearing a lot of that stuff. But remember, it's the same Chambers of Commerce that support open borders and amnesty, too. And why do they support it? Because they, they want cheap, unskilled labor. I, don't give me that it's all this uh, uh, absolute concern for people of different cultures or for the suffering or the poor. It's about workers. It's about the kind. We've got enough CEOs. We've got enough executives. What we need are what? Drone type workers. And I, I honestly, and I'm, I've talked too long. I honestly believe that that's the kind of thing that Common Core produces. S uh, sur sur subservient. Uh, drone-like, trusting in government individuals who don't seek to rise very high, high above where the state has placed them. That's what Common Core is to me. I'm sorry, Dave. <laughs> I wish we had one.